When I was 14, you on? Yes. When I was 14, my Uncle Ted, who was Mary Ann's, my cousin Mary Ann's father, gave me a camera for my birthday. And uh, Uncle Ted was very quiet and soft-smoking, and all the other male relatives I knew of in Bayonne were just the opposite. Always loud and, uh, what's the word that begins with B? Boisterous. Boisterous, yes, thank you. As opposed to the women who would be go girlsterous. The men were boisterous yeah, uh, and the women were girlsterous. Girl uh, okay. You didn't get that from me. No. Uh, and he told me about how to set it up to take the amount of pictures. So this little camera held 127 film, which probably hasn't been made for the last 60 years or so. And I think the first roll, I think it took 36 frames. And the first roll, I had four come out, and none of them are uh, any good. You couldn't tell what they were of. But I kept at it. And then... Uh, that little brownie with 127 film was a good camera, though. Oh, that was that. Well, this wasn't even a brownie. It had 127 film? Yep. I, I used to use 127 when I first started taking... This was a little bitty thing. A little square. Yeah. Yep. And, uh... I might still have it. Talk to me. <coughs> Who knows? So, I don't know. My dad encouraged me with this. And we got dark room. He, some, somebody he worked with uh, did photography, too. And so he got me the three trays and the film clips and the red light. And the film then was all ortho, orthochromatic, which means you could, it's not sensitive to red. And you can use the red light, the film red light when you're developing it now. Uh, black and white film is mostly panchromatic. It's sensitive to all colors. Unless you want ortho, I'm sure you can still get it. Anyway, I learned to do that. And, uh, and you get the negatives, you dry them. And when you, and I think you talked to a lot of old time photographers, the first time you put a sheet of white paper in a clear solution and you see a picture, an image slowly come up, and that hooks you. <coughs> and that's why a lot of people got in photography, the magic of that first picture coming up. Uh -huh. And uh, so I went off from there, and then one summer I'd worked a lot on the farm for my dad, so he bought me a Ciroflex, which was a twin lens reflex. So it's the, uh, pretty much the type that amateurs used in that day. They had two lenses, the top one, and then a viewfinder. You viewed to the top one and took the picture to the bottom one, which worked okay unless you got real close and you're on this problem of parallax where you're seeing is now what the uh, film lens is seeing. But I, I used that, and uh, for a while I didn't do, do too much busy in college, but then I went into service. And I got sent to an Air Force base. I didn't even know they had any. So I told uh, somebody who worked in the office that I had to, I could do darkroom work. And I guess somebody told them that I was a, got, had a degree in photography or something. Hmm. So they put me in the darkroom. And uh, I worked there, but you couldn't, the, the whole Coast Guard had a billet of 30 photographers and had 32, so it was two over billet. So I knew I'd never get advanced there. So I went to uh, aviation electronics school in Memphis, in Millington, near Memphis. Came back, and when you go to something like that, you go uh, TDY, what do you call it, TAD in the Air Force? TDY. TDY, I actually call it TAD, Temporary Additional Duty. duty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're out of the district. Now, the Coast Guard had the country divided up the districts, and, uh, the Great Lakes here is District 9. So you sent temporary additional duty out of the district. Then you go back and report to district headquarters for reassignment. But there was only one air base in that district, so I now I go back to uh, Traverse City. And I got back there and started doing, uh, I'll think, electronics, which I never learned in school. And then they put me back in the dark room again for a while. So I kind of did both jobs. And uh, then after that, for probably 20 years or so, I bet I never took a picture. Your mother took all of the family photos, all the family snapshots. Mm -hmm. And now I was getting close to retirement, and you all had flown the coop. I thought I'd get back into it. This was always in the back of my mind, retirement hobby. 
and uh, what was popular at that time were the 35 millimeter pictures, most people shooting slides. And I could never get used to, even now, can't get used to that little viewfinder. Because in the service I had 4x5 viewfinder cameras, different kinds, but you basically you look at a 4x5 image. And uh, looking through that little thing, I could never get used to it. I shot some colored slides and I tried developing. I missed developing. Dark and I think uh, Greg gave me his enlarger, because he was into this. And uh, I blackened off the kitchen in Beaver Falls, and I did some developing and printing in there, and brought that here, and set up this. We had a, uh, I guess it's called an Arizona room in New York. It's called a New York room. It's half screened in, half solid wall. I don't know what it's called in Mississippi. Screen porch? Huh? Screen porch. Screen porch, okay. I converted that into dark room. Oh, okay. And uh, then Greg let me use his uh, 4x5 camera, uh, single lens reflex, and that's a nice camera. But you always want something bigger. The bigger the negative, the less you have to enlarge it, so the fewer de defects are going to show up. Mm -hmm. And so eventually I got a 4x5. Uh, Uh, view camera for large formats, what I'm looking for. And I got a better and larger than one you saw up there. And I could do some pretty good black and white pictures. Beautiful. And I uh, joined the camera club. And I learned a lot there. <coughs> but you have to be careful if you join a cap join a camera club or any club of this type where they have exhibitions or whatever you do. Maybe it's near to near to knitting quilts or something and then they're judged. Mm -hmm. And you can get to the point where you're making this object to satisfy the judge, not to satisfy yourself. It's very easy to do. And uh, so some of the members started to go, go into digital. I said, ah, this is just a fad. It's going to work. It's, and to, even to this day, I, draw, I kind of miss working in the dark room. Mm -hmm. But everybody's going digital. I think I was the last one, and Office Depot had a camera on sale, and I got that, and I went digital. <coughs> Eventually got rid of all my uh, other my dark room equipment. You still got your dark room out there. You can get some more stuff. Well, you know it's a lot more expensive. Go second hand, Joe. Hmm? Go second hand. You didn't get rid of everything, did you? Everything but the enlarger and some trays, which. No, I, I wouldn't go back to it now, I don't think. Why not? You might love it. <coughs> well, then my legs get tired after I'm out there for an hour. My legs get tired. They go for a half hour more than once. That's not long enough to do anything. But the thing is, you can do so much more in digital. I couldn't make the pictures that I am, make now. Really? Yeah. And of course, you don't do color. You can do color in black and white, but it's, uh, I mean, you can't do color in the dark room. But you don't have much control. <coughs> and Ansel Adams, everybody heard of Ansel Adams, <coughs> uh, photography. <coughs> he sh shot some colors. Mostly black and white? Yeah, uh, and he shot some on assignment because he did assignment. But he didn't like the control you had of black and white. And he was a master darkroom operator. You know, he would be in there all, all night, didn't sleep at night. He'd be working get this picture just right. And there are times, you can find these probably in some of the books about him, where he would over time <coughs> take the same negative and produce what looks like an almost completely different picture, huh. just by the different darkroom manipulations. Just huh. dodging and, uh, and so that's where I am now, digital. And it's a lot of fun, but it can be frustrating, but that's all part of any hobby, I guess. Uh, and some people will look at some things done in digital, they say, no, well, that's not photography. Because you're changing things too much, not the real scene. Well, I could go on and on about that. But if anybody feels that way, look <coughs> up a photographer named Jerry Olsman. I think it's J-A-R-R-Y-U-L-S-E-M-A-N. He may be dead now, but here you can find his works. And he made some very 
unusual pictures, all in black and white, all in traditional darkroom work. He had nine uh, enlarger set up. <coughs> so from one to the other, making changes, combining several negatives. I could recall one, somebody's hands like this, now the hands are the roots of a tree in the tree. Mm -hmm. Now uh, the tree is uh, much smaller, the hands are roughly the scale. Well, that's pretty hard to do in a traditional dark room. But, but he did stuff like that. He the did computer. Hmm? Mm -hmm. He did computer stuff like. But you can you could do that on a computer, yeah, fairly easily. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> so. Go back to Traverse City. <clears throat> you said <clears throat> you did some darkroom work, but mostly it was electronics. No. Hmm? Yeah, I don't know. They and did back and forth. You were... And then you stood watches in, in the radio room. Mm -hmm. So did you were you did radio room work on the ground? Or uh, did you go out on planes? You went out on planes. In right? the uh, radio shack, and you repair things. Yeah, and I, I froze uh, in the... Uh, you asked the amphibian planes that we used for search and rescue. I flew those as radio men, and that was for the most part rather boring. Really? I'd go on helicopter sometimes, uh, just because I needed a second person or to take pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, training flights. I could justify being in the training flight. And that's interesting because you fly only 500 feet above the ground. One of the helicopters we had was just a two seater. <coughs> so, plexiglass bubble all except the bottom floor where the pedals were and so you had a good view of things. Hmm. Scary, huh? Hmm? No, it's scary, it's fun. But I had some pictures, I enlarged some, I took of some scenes, 16 by 20, and somehow, I think I never framed them or mounted them, but I think I had them rolled up and somehow <coughs> they got ripped when we moved. You mean you, did you have taken pictures then, during that time? Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I take the camera home, the photo officer said, take it home, you practicing. So I took it home for the weekend. Mm -hmm. I had my two days off and took a lot of pictures then. Mm -hmm. Go home and I go to work and double. Develop them on <coughs> company time. Mm -hmm. How many kids did you have then? Uh, started off with one and then with three. So that was, you joined the Coast Guard when you had Joe? Yeah. Your Joe was, was pregnant with Joe. She was pregnant with Joe, okay. Yeah. And she was born, and Joe was born in Mishapin. Yeah. And then you went to the Coast Guard. <coughs> Traverse City. <coughs> and Anne Marie was born. Yeah. All right. <coughs> and then when you went to Millington? Or did you go? Yeah, and then back to Traverse City. Back to Traverse City. <coughs> That's what you meant when you said you you'd get back to the same region and you know there was only yeah, one base same because you're temporarily assigned from that district <coughs> and there was only one air base in the district so I know it's going to make there. Mm -hmm. What year was that honey? What year? What year did you get out of the Coast Guard? I got out in 58. 58? <coughs> really? Yeah. Uh, that year I went to Millington was 56. You went to Dominica? Millington. Millington. Oh Millington. That's outside of Memphis. <coughs> so the naval air base was. Uh, okay, another interesting tale. I think I may have written about this. When you went in the service, whether you joined or drafted in those drafted in those days, you had an eight-year commitment. So I had that five years active duty. Then I went in the inactive reserve. And so my eight years was up in November of '62. I don't remember the exact date. And this was a time of the Cuban <coughs> Missile Crisis. Did you study that in school? Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, I got a package from the uh, Coast Guard. I said, oh, this is my discharge papers. And it wasn't. It was <coughs> orders to be ready to go to New report to New York for active duty in the event of a war. Mm. There was all kinds of things. Some of the papers I had to sign out. There was a uh, transportation pass in case they restricted civilian transportation. You had this pass that you could get to New York City. <coughs> did, you have any IB, did you have IBM cards? <coughs> no. A stack of IBM. That's what I had, a stack of IBM cards <coughs> that, you know, you give along the way till they know who you are. This is before IBM cards, I think, because I didn't see those until I was 
maybe not. Anyway, I didn't sign this, any of these, and I wrote a letter and I said my uh, time is up, you know, uh, as of November 50 or so, 1962. I sent it back and I waited and about two months later I finally got my discharge. And then the Cuban Missile Crisis was over. Mm. Well, I wanted to get I was back. a little unnerving when I wrapped that package instead of a discharge. It had this, uh, had these forms to fill out. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So, tell, you, tell us some funny stories about when your kids were little. Which one was the goofiest? Hmm? <laughs> Which one was the goofiest? Oh, it's about a six-way tie. Six-way tie. <laughs> <coughs> That's diplomatic, isn't it? <coughs> um. Okay. <laughs> oh, this was John's boat on me. We had the <coughs> Dodge van. Mm -hmm. He could sit on the engine, and we were in uh, Watertown. Every time he stopped to go to the store, I kind of checked to make sure there were <coughs> six little kids in the car. And so we pulled away someplace. I said, we've got everybody. And somebody said, where's John? I slammed on the brakes and I turned around. John says, I got you. Oh. <laughs> where where, you mean where he's, was he? And he was sitting right behind me on the engine. Is he the one that called out? He's, he's the one that called out, where's John? Yeah. That always stuck in my mind. How can he be behind you when you not know it? kids all over the place. <laughs> I didn't know who was saying, where's John? <coughs> I thought it was one of the other kids. I didn't know. I just saw the other voice. Oh. Uh, oh, I don't know. All right. Um, what about going to school, Joe? Going to school where? The, the kids, when they went to school. Huh? What happened then, when they were started in school? Oh, I remember the bus used to come up to pick them on. I guess the kids would tease you quite a bit. Maybe this was before. The what? The kids would tease them because the bus had to make this detour to come up our dirt road. And so they didn't want to pick the bus, so they went with me to school or they walked. And uh, pretty much the rule was if it was above zero, you walked. Mm -hmm. You too? Me too, yeah. But zero below, and it wasn't snowing, of course, then we uh, drove. How many, how many years did you live there? Absolutely. I think uh, 13. Not too long then. No, it wasn't. Look back at it. That's a, that was the most important block of time of my life, I think, because that's where I raised my family. We had our first house. You know, I did farming and gardening and all this, and I enjoyed that, even though it was really tough financially. You moved there in, what, 54? Six, no, there we moved in 60... 66 into Beaver 66, Falls. Yeah. Where and did you live before that? Belfort. <coughs> so, wait a minute, so then in Beaver Falls you moved out in, six, in 79? Seven. You moved into the... Yeah, I saw it in 80, into, I think. In 80. Yeah. But you were pretty happy to have that. Have your own house, your own yeah. land. Yeah, you know, we were married, I think, 13 years before we had a better house. Yeah, most couples buy a house long before then, unless they're well, military. They're school teachers. <clears throat> so, but was it a little bit of a dream then to have your place and have have a little bit of a farm? You yeah, talked about that before. Yeah. yeah. Start tilling some things. Hmm? Start tilling some, some yeah. land, going some organic. Soil, grow some mm -hmm. animals. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, something I... Now, what so animals did you start out with in Beaver Falls? Chicken. No, I didn't have to go first. We got goats first. Goats first? One goat, yeah. Mm -hmm. What was that one goat's name? Millie? Jenny. Huh? Jenny was the Jenny. first? Jenny. Yeah. And then we bought another one uh, from some place. I was a good hour to drive, I think. That was Minnie or Millie? I think Minnie. And yeah. then we had a male. Well, I guess the first one we, we took to Genzo's. Remember Genzo's? <coughs> yeah. That's where I caught uh, one goat, first goat from. There was a Heidi. <coughs> <coughs> Heidi was a reddish-brown goat. How many goats did you end up with? 
Uh, I think the most we probably had three females. Uh, I think only two at a time to milk, and they didn't. We didn't really? get a lot of good production out of them. But was, was there a lot of work involved with them? Well, you got to be there twice a day to take care of them to milk them, you know, just like cows. Yeah. And the uh, kids are <coughs> afraid about that sometimes. We got to go home now because it's time to milk the goats. Uh -huh. uh, and we have the young ones. And I try to keep them fenced in. I had electric fence and barbed wire fence. They still would get up. Yeah. I remember the the, the male was the, you got Hank. Yeah. I remember a couple of them, and Hank busted everything outside. Finally, you took him inside boat? the male bottom. Boat? Yeah. He took him inside the bottom of the of the barn. And and took a real thick chain and set it in concrete in the middle of it. Oh yeah. Yeah. I don't remember, you remember that. that? Mm -hmm. He died. Well, eventually he died, but um, not then. No. Uh, that's the, to restrain him. him. Other goats, then. <clears throat> that's the only way that you could restrain him. Yeah. Well, males are. When they're nasty. when they're ready, they're ready. Yeah. And you, nothing's going to hold them back. <clears throat> and then pigs. A couple a couple yeah, pigs, or at least one. The, Pardon? You raise two or three batches of pigs. Mm -hmm. You buy two piglets and you raise them up to a butchering size and you uh, sell one. Maybe we had the, both of them butchered and sold two halves, I forget. Then we had the other one for ourselves. And uh, so I got the meat from a one pig for basically nothing because, you know, what, what you sell it for, it covered the cost of the pig and the cost of raising it up to butchering size. So that was a pretty good deal, unless you had the fresh meat. Didn't you mind killing it? Well, I had somebody kill it for me, but I killed them. Yeah. Oh, I couldn't do that. Well, think about that the next time you eat some meat. I don't eat a lot of meat, you know that. Yeah, I know. <coughs> think about that the next time you go to the <coughs> outback and have that thick jersey steak yeah, but yeah. and that cute little steer. Oh. Did you ever think of having a cow, Dad? Hmm? Did you ever think of getting a cow? No. But I, li I like smaller animals for some reason. Mm -hmm. you a hen, I guess. We had rabbits, yeah. I forgot about Lots rabbits. of rabbits. When did you get those uh, those things with the fur that you used to oh, get? Oh, chinchillas? Uh, oh, I remember. Uh, then we got rid of all the others. Because didn't you get the fur to anime? Hmm? Anna Mae got the fur from the chinchillas, didn't she? No, we sold it. You sold it? Yeah, we, it was several years before we sold any. We didn't get any. They weren't very good. It's, it's difficult. Uh, now we got a good male, and then we got some. Talking about the fur was not good? Yeah, that good quality. The weakest spot is the neck. And uh, I had trouble with. Uh, <laughs> and dying and not breeding, and, and I guess it was, uh, if the males get an infection, the females are in individual cages. Then you've got a runway in the back, where one male can run along and get down to make to all the females. <laughs> Sounds not, not a bad arrangement there. No, it doesn't work. Sure. Oh, a guy. Male chinchilla, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't sound like a bad line to work. <laughs> so well, Scott, when you come back, you want to come back as a male chinchilla. <coughs> on a chinchilla farm. <coughs> well, one time I got a price of about $72, I think, for a chinchilla. Wow. That's a fur about this long. And the advantage of chinchillas <coughs> over other fur bearing animals is that they're uh, herbivores. If you have mink, fox, or anything else, you've got to feed the meat. But here, uh, uh, the best deal you have to buy. Uh, <coughs> blocks of alfalfa. They produce a little box like this and you put them in holders. And you also bought <coughs> dust, which came from someplace I think in California, a very, fi very, very fine dust. It had a round can like a coffee can, a gallon coffee can or something, and you cut the bottom, top half of it out so it hold the dust and make it in there and they dust their fur that way. Ah, I'll be darned. Yeah. It's interesting, Joe. 
chinchilla coat is one of the most expensive, more than mink, I think you can. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's why. They're special made. I mean, you can throw it away. Well, that, I'm glad I got rid of them the way that because now the attitude is all against the killing animals for fur. But that's been a long time ago. It's back mm -hmm. again. Now you can is have it? fur now. Mm -hmm. Now fur is back in, I think. So let me ask you a question, Dad. Hmm? What, what were some of the most important decisions you made in your life? Probably during the Coast Guard was one. I don't know. Getting married? Getting married, yeah. Twice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, uh, I'd be retiring. I don't know, yes and no. Like my mother said, I asked, uh, Who was the uh, uh, Larry? Larry Corey was the business manager, the mm -hmm. business principal. Mm -hmm. and I asked him to do something for me to kind of find out whether it would be would pay for me to retire or not. And he did a lot of work to answer my question. I just didn't have to do it as part of the job. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought about it, but just. It was so cool. One time, you know, if I ever stayed up there, I'd get a, a, want a, a hot water heater, a hot air heater. I remember being so cold, my legs would get so cold, and I'd turn the furnace up, and it shuts off, my legs are still cold. When it's 10, 15 below zero, that heat, cold just comes right through. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, I remember coming back from Rome one evening, and I get up <coughs> the high <coughs> Snowing and snowing, hardly see. So we got to uh, Glen Glendale, Glendale, <coughs> South Lewis School. Mm -hmm. And he could take a cut down to Route 12, the low road. Mm -hmm. So I thought if I went down there, I'd be able to see better. And I got behind a uh, sand truck, plowing and sanding. Well, you can't pass them. You can't see right past them. And they go top speed, 35 miles an hour. So. And it took me about, I don't know, two and a half, three hours to get home from Rome. And boy, that gets tiresome too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, just, uh, <coughs> and I thought maybe a change in life would be good for me. But back up to but why did you decide to be a teacher? That, was, that must have been a decision too, or was it the only the option was available at some point? You know, in high school, uh, I thought you really got to be stupid to be a teacher. <laughs> Most of our teachers, the only one could control the dis control disciplines, control the students. That was a math teacher, and uh, the rest of them just don't tell anything forward. juicy till I get back. Okay, I gotta let go of the ladies' room. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll get a drink here. It wasn't anything juicy. That I'm gonna tell about. No, keep going. You talk about teachers, teachers, what? teachers. You said why? Why you became yeah. a teacher? And uh, you know, got to be stupid to be a teacher. And I know they didn't make much, but I never, you know, that young, you don't think a lot about salary. You think about what you want to do. So I got to college, <coughs> and you have some of these professors that are experts at their field. I thought, here's somebody who knows all there is to know about something, even though maybe just a little bit of matter, a little bit of knowledge. But he knows all that. And that really impressed me. And so I thought more and more about perhaps going into teaching. And then when I got into service, I thought, uh, wait till Mary comes back. Okay. Let me fill up my water bottle. Okay. <coughs> 